I want to point out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 472nd edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. And, whoops, I just lost this. This will be quick. Uh, every day I get up and I do my, um, I do searches the internet to, to put together a blog for my blog uh, sp uh, site called geoharvey.com. You can go there. It is G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. You can go and see the, the uh, materials that we're talking about. I find uh, 10 to 15 articles that I put up, each with a synopsis and a link. And then once a week, Tom and I get together yeah. on Thursday afternoons. The best of the blog. Best of the blog. And, and uh, uh, I, I try to notify you if it's a particularly good thing and worth following up and looking at. Yeah. Because some of them definitely are. Absolutely. Some of them contain all sorts of information. That's right. And I'm going to zoom this up a little bit. There we go. Um, so we're starting. Uh, we're starting on Thursday, May 2nd. All day. All day. Yeah. Today being the 19th. We're yeah. starting a week ago today. And we have an item here that has a picture of Hurricane Sam. So it's the 12th, not the 2nd. 12th. This is, it says minute two here. We are starting on the 12th of yeah. May. <laughs> I don't know. Did I actually say you said 2nd, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's not old age. You know, when I was 13, I actually spent half an hour searching for a pencil I was holding in my left hand. <laughs> I hate it when I things, <laughs> things have not got worse since much, but they certainly haven't got any better either. Okay, we have an item from CNN, and you know everything about it, don't you, Tom? I do. You do? I think you do. I guess I do, but it's the first one here. Hurricane Sam, a picture of Hurricane That's Sam. That's right. Which I will bring up here if I can. You're allowed to. And there's Hurricane I won't that, stop That you. doesn't look there. like Hurricane Sam, does it? It looks like a hurricane. <laughs> well, in any case, it's a, it's a NASA image, and it says, Reducing harmful air pollution has led to a surprising effect. This is from CNN. More hurricanes in the North Atlantic. Yeah, this is from CNN. There have been other effects that are like this, too. A study published in Science Advances found that as aerosol pollution decreases in the decades following, um, following the U.S. Clean Air Act and similar actions in Europe, the ocean could absorb more sunlight, which fueled more storms. Now, they had a thing later than this where they were talking about how the monsoons became more reliable when the aerosols disappeared because the heat the sun was able to heat up the earth instead of the higher atmosphere, and that caused the the up uh, more on, drafts more that brought more water in. For, yeah. Well, uh, decreasing emissions yeah. is good for health. Yes. But there are negative effects on hurricane activity. Yes. A 40% decline in pollution in China and India sparked a 14% increase in storms. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. make sense, does it? No. An increase in storms is an unintended and challenging consequence. Yes. And I give a little bit of a background here. Aerosols are tiny particles that float in the air right. and reflect sunlight back to space, which has a cooling effect. Okay, they come from sources like industrial smokestacks and car exhaust. As aerosol pollution decreases, the ocean can absorb more sunlight, leading to a warmer sea temperature and more storms. Yes. So that's what's happening, folks. Okay, we have an item next from Renews. 
We got a picture here. That's not the right picture. That's the picture. Pull that picture up here if I can. That picture has wind there turbines. There we go. If I get that picture up here. There you go. And it is a picture, believe it or not, of wind turbines. Didn't I just say that? That's what you just said. I was just repeating it. Oh, okay. Just in case. Checking on, on me, are you? On the West Coast in here. <laughs> now this, yeah, here we go. And I'm looking at that, and I'm wondering what that field is here. It looks like grapes, but it's not. No, that's not grapes. It's not grapes. I don't know what it is. Well, European Energy and Vestas, the company, forge an offshore turbine team. European Energy Investors have teamed up for a joint adventure aiming to develop and build three of Vesta's new V236 15.0 megawatt offshore wind turbines. Now, that designation means that this turbine has a, has a swept area that is 236 meters across. That's where the 236 comes from. Yep. Okay. And the 15.0 is 15.0 megawatts. So these, they're, what they're, they're doing is... size turbines. That's about as big <laughs> as they get so far. Um, it's an offshore wind turbine. At least three test positions, which are now under development by European Energy, about four kilometers off the coast of the city of Fried Friedrichshaven. Freddystown. Freddie, well, his harbor, actually, yeah. off in his harbor. Well, Vestas aims at using the offshore wind test turbines yes. to prove the viability of the technology in an offshore environment. Right. And also provide early know-how with the installation methods and the training of electricians. So they're, ser they're serious about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. This Danish city will be a global focal point for test and demonstration of new offshore wind technology. There you go. So we'll be hearing a little bit more about Frederick Sabine. I, I think that's probably true. This so next I, picture is kind of interesting, unless you have more. It even moves up. I'm talking out loud to myself. Ah, okay. <laughs> we got a picture here. Um, this is an interesting picture. It's, it's an interesting picture. If it, you look at it really close, that bar on the bottom there, it's got five turbines on it. Six turbines. Six Six turbines? Yeah, I yeah, guess it is six turbines. One there. They're, they are turbines, but they're awful small compared to what well, we're Well, compared used to. to the ones we were just talking about, they're unbelievably tiny. <laughs> but at the same time, if you tip that thing down into the water and anchor it properly, it's going to well, give you a lot of energy. That's what they're planning on doing. They're yeah, going to well, sink that ship and they're going to put it down in the water and yep. it's going to be turned by the tide. That's right. This is from Marine Link. Well, it's a t they're tidal turbines and an installation ship. That's what the picture yeah. is. And it says that the first floating tidal power plant, or whoa, 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 I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. The first <laughs> floating tidal power has been delivered to the Nova Scotia grid. Okay, Sustainable Marine said it has successfully harnessed the tidal currents in Canada's Bay of Fundy, delivering the first floating in-stream tidal power to, the, to Nova Scotia's grid. The project has enabled Sustainable Marine to acquire skills and resources to deliver turnkey projects. And this, is, this was something that I was really impressed by because They've been trying for years to do this. Well, we've talked about it. Yeah, and every time they try something new, the the tide the, <laughs> is so fast there that it just tears the, the equipment apart. Well, the Bay apart. of Fundy, at 14 feet, has the highest tides in the world. Okay. Okay, and that's part of what's going on there. Wow. Is they're dumping an awful lot of water in there. Now, we looked at something before that uh, got its power by the, the water going up and down, okay. rising and falling. This gets its power by the, flat, by the water flowing in and out. Okay. So okay. Nova Scotia has allotted circa 30 megawatts of capacity for developers to demonstrate their energy generation prowess, positioning Nova Scotia as a global player in the tidal energy sector. Now that what they what they're well, they saying got the is, resources there. Yeah, what they're saying is they are going to allow people to put in 38 megawatts of of tidal turbines of various kinds, so they can find out which which one's one better. works best. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, they got to figure out what what works better: the water flowing in and out, or the water flowing up and down. I think it 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sustainable Marine, the company, has acquired a multi-purpose construction vessel, which we're looking at there, Yeah. called the Tidal Pioneer. Wow. And a suite of next-generation remotely operated subsea insulation machines. You know, I'm looking at that vessel. I'll bet there's no sw there's no bunks on it to sleep in. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look it's like it. It's not exactly no, huge. There's a bunch of guys there, but uh, they're sleeping somewhere else. I think you're right. This project and others are creating green technologies, green jobs, a cleaner environment, and a predictable, renewable source of electricity for Nova Scotia. Right. Okay, bingo. we're up to fr I'm sorry, what? I said bingo. We're up to Friday, May 13th. And Friday we've got the 13th. An item from Oil Price. And we got a picture and here. And we have a picture of the, the Vodal plant. Yes, it is. It's the Vodal plant on, on, being built. Well, we've talked about the Vodal. Oh, Vodal. We've a been bunch talking of about times. it for a year. Yeah. The, that plant has been up, has been under construction. Well, uh, let me put it this way. That picture showing the construction on the left, the plant, what you see on the right is the earlier reactors and so forth that were that were in operation when this was taken. But the stuff on the left was was that picture was taken before this show started being recorded by over a year, over two years. Well, Vodal's been in the news for a long time. Yeah, they and never can quite get their act together. Not quite. So, <laughs> what do you have for well, a title? Well, they started with uh, one. They're yeah. trying to put as many as five in there. Well, and they're running into problems, all sorts of problems. Yeah, many of which we've talked about. Absolutely. What do you got for this? We got a title, don't we? Yeah, we Six do. years late and 250% over budget, Georgia's newest nuclear plant. The Municipal Energy Authority of Georgia announced that the Vodal 3 and 4 nuclear generating stations approaching completion in that state are now likely to cost roughly $34 billion. Huh? <laughs> That they were originally estimated to cost fourteen billion dollars, and be operational in two thousand seventeen. That's two hundred fifty percent over budget. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's right. It's crazy. Vodal initially promised a six-year construction time, factory-built modules to speed up construction, and a commercial service cost of sixty-four hundred dollars six cents per kilowatt, six cents a kilowatt hour. Instead, we see a 14-year construction project and an astounding $15,500 per kilowatt. Why is this technology still struggling for commercial respectability? Actually, I think it is why is anybody bothering to try to... To fix it. To fix it. <laughs> I mean, this Last is crazy. year, Europe spent about $40 billion to add 26 gigawatts of renewables. So that's what's happening. In the U.S., we're spending $34 billion for 2.2 gigawatts of nuclear. Yeah, no, <laughs> nuclear. That makes Vodal 10 times as expensive on a gigawatt basis than the European alternatives. Yeah, a lot of people say nuclear. Oh, yeah. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy used Carter, who was a nuclear engineer. That's center. right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, should we go on? I think of George Bush, though, Jr. He said nuclear, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, Definitely. I don't know how you get that out of that spelling, but you know. <laughs> should we go on? Yeah, we got another picture here of guess what? It says an oil rig. Well, it is. It's it, otherwise known as a nodding donkey or a dotting donkey or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> nodding donkey. And this is from Clean Technica. Saving the books and cooking the planet. Well, there da -da -da -da. you go. Oil and gas companies are increasingly using mergers and acquisitions to offload emissions from their balance sheets and meet corporate climate targets without actually reducing emissions at That's all. That's fun. <laughs> oh, man. You know, th this is this is symptomatic of what's wrong, in my opinion, with a large part of our... T of yeah, our, they're trying to beat the... Beat it's called... It's called gaming the numbers. That's exactly what it's called. This yeah. is according to the Environmental Defense Fund, a report that examined mergers and acquisitions in 2017 through 2021. That's what, that's how people make money. It's 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 gaming the numbers. If, it's cheating. It, yeah, it's basically <laughs> cheating. And and if you talk to real businessmen in real business about doing that, they're going to say, "Yes, of course, that's, that's what we that's do." That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, the Environmental Defense Fund found 155 deals that resulted in assets moving away from companies with no with net zero pledges. Yes. Okay, and 211 deals from companies with stated goals to reduce methane emissions. Yeah. Okay, so they're playing the game. In total, deals involve, involving reduced environmental commitment transfers, that's in quotes, rose from 10% in 2018 to 15% in 2021. Mm. Must uh, be good for business. I think it probably is. Uh, what okay. Do I, what do I do? I'm talking to myself. I don't know. Our next this, item next is from CNN. Get, get the, the picture up. Put that picture up just to make sure. I don't remember seeing it up on the on the thing. You've all you got to do is that's right. Click on that one. There you go. That's oh. the nodding donkey, and I'm going to change this to. Yeah, this is the one we're looking for. A canal in Venice, California. It I didn't look, even know there were canals in Venice, California. Oh, well, they got canals all over California, and a lot of them are empty. Looks like a nice town. It does. This is from CNN. I don't know anything about Venice, California. I did come across this picture of the canal. That canal picture is six years old. That's when the drought was barely started, and you'll notice the boats are up on the on the. I doubt there's any more than a trickle of water in that canal today. Not too much. Well, yeah. the boats boats aren't in the water, but they're no. uh, they're available to be put in the water yeah. instantly. Yeah. Okay, so what, what do you got, got for here? title? As water runs short in California, commission rejects a $1.4 billion desalination plant. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know what people had on their minds here. But anyway, the synopsis says, as water crisis looms in California, the state's coastline line protection agency unanimously rejected the development of a $1.4 billion desalination plant at Huntington Beach, which is probably not anywhere near Venice, I'm not sure, that would have converted ocean water into municipal water for Orange County residents. Well, desalination works by separating water molecules from salty seawater. Is that done with tweezers? No, they use reverse osmosis. Oh, do they? Is that like <laughs> tweezers, but you hold them backwards? That's something like something that. Something like that. <laughs> the leftover high salinity brine is sent back to the ocean. Yes. And in Poseidon Water Development, the company has been trying to build this plant for decades. Yes. Okay, they said the plant would have been capable of producing 50 million gallons of drinking water a day. Which but is here's the opposition. Desalination opponents argue that less expensive and less harmful conservation tactics should be the first resort. In other I words, to, you don't need it. I want to hear what those less expensive conservation tactics are. It's like sending out the, the, the black-suited guys with big guns to tell you that you're only going to get water half an hour a day. Is that <laughs> what it is? I don't know. The commission pointed to desalination's incredible energy consumption. Yeah. Okay. Its impacts on marine life, projected sea level rise, and the cost of the resulting water itself, with that cost being passed on by to customers. Yeah. And so and it's it's not the be all and end all. Yeah. The, and the Coastal Commission um, undoubtedly took all of that into account. And I've been I joked about bad guys, and you know the fact of the matter is. They, I have no doubt that they took it all into account. And then they came up with a una unanimous vote. Now, whether they would do that three or four years from now, when the drought is even worse than it is now, I don't know. Well, we'll have to see. You know, we will. Well, We're up to Saturday. Meanwhile, let's see what's going on on Saturday, May 14th. We are up to Saturday, May 14th. We and have we a picture, picture of the of a Kua nuclear plant and a, an article from oil price, which is, by the way, oilprice.com. Well, we'll look, we, got the, we got the picture up. Yes, we do. That's in the south of France. Yes. And as you can see by this picture, it has four reactors. Yes, you can. Those are the buildings with this kind and of And there short, are actually two more cooling domes. towers that, that you can't, you can't see, see in this picture. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what do you got for a title for the article? France's power sector further strained by extended outages and repairs. France's nuclear power plants 
have uh, are to have repairs and extended outages, leading to a 25 percent decrease in power output next winter. That's now, significant. Here we are in the spring, and they're talking about next winter. I, we should probably explain that. An analysis from Beringa Partners said. The shortage will happen just as EU countries are scrambling for energy as they reduce imports of oil and gas from Russia. Well, this winter, electricity mm -hmm. flowing to the nations that France typically supplies is set to be reversed. Yes. As power prices within France are pushed higher and less amid less right. supply. Right. And France generates more than 70 percent of its total electricity from nuclear. That's right. So Germany has its plans to shutter all of its nuclear plants by 2022. Right. Which is coming right up, folks. Yep. And okay, whereas France sees nuclear power as a necessary step that will allow the country to move away from fossil fuels. They 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 were getting 70% of their of their energy from from nuclear plants a long time ago, and they haven't been building they, new plants to replace the old ones that they've got anywhere near fast enough to actually so do they're the going to be in, they're going to be in some kind of trouble. Well, I think the point is we're getting into trouble. Yeah. And um, the, in the United States, I, I, as part of my blog, I keep track of the, of the power plants that are open and closed and at partial power and so forth constantly. Okay, good. And, you know, you can get that information if you know what links to click and so forth. And um, the power plants go down for refueling in the spring and in the fall. And the reason for that is so there's sufficient power in the summer and the winter. And in the winter. That's the high peak loads. Those are the high peak loads. Yeah. And heating, yeah. yeah. And what is happening now is that the French can't do that. Because of whatever reasons, they have to have some of these plants down in the winter when they really should have all their plants running. So it's hard to know. And the other thing is, <clears throat> for refueling, you have to order the fuel typically a year and a Quite half a in advance. advance. Yes. So absolutely. if you're less than a year and a half from a refueling that is going to be from, from shutdown, if you're less than a year and a half from shutdown, which all these German plants are, it's almost impossible to get fuel quickly enough. You can't enough. get your fuel in a local hardware store. No, you cannot. And, and you know, the idea of shutting the plant down, leaving it down for months, and then turning it back on again is not something they find attractive. So it's, this is not an easy thing. I had a, I had a, a friend who was saying, Vermont Yankee, they're going to shut it off. It's, it's a, still a perfectly good little nuclear power plant. And wasn't making money. It wasn't, wasn't making, making money. enough money. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, if you go down and, t and tell them that you want them to keep it going and they're, they are willing to get enter into a conversation with you, they're going to tell you it's less than a year. It's too late. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Meanwhile, okay. a few are sitting there in the uh, yard waiting just to uh, cause trouble. Yeah. The, the they got no place fuel. to put it. And no yeah. way to get it there. Yeah. Okay. Our next item comes nice from Euro picture. News, and we have a picture of an offshore wind turbine. Is that what that is? That's I not a light bulb is. in the back of there. Is no, it? I, I think that's actually um, something. I think that's bigger than a light bulb. <laughs> okay. What do you got for a title? Well, I'll have to look it up here and figure it out. That means I got to scroll this thing, and it doesn't want to scroll. Maybe it's just, oh, because I'm using the wrong mouse. Yeah. Well, that's an offshore wind turbine. Yes. And uh, it comes from Norwegian Hydro. Well, Norway turns its back on gas and oil to be a renewable superpower. I got news for you. Norway's already a renewable superpower. Well, Norway has gas. It has oil. It's, it has hydro. It's, got, it's making money, and it has been for years and years. That's, that's always been, yeah. even before they needed it. Yes. Even before electricity was invented. Um, really? <laughs> I was unaware of that. Anyway, um, Norway has unveiled plans for a major expansion of its offshore wind energy production by 2040, aiming to turn a country that, was, that has built its wealth on oil and gas into an exporter of renewable electricity. The government set a target to develop 30 gigawatts 
of offshore wind capacity. Gigawatts? By gigawatts. <laughs> what does that mean? Gigawatts. That's right. 30 gigawatts of offshore wind. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say that's probably a little more than, fi than 15 mi large nuclear power plants. Okay. Pretty large, but uh, larger yeah. than the one we had here. Oh, much, much larger than well, that. Well, on this one, there's a one minute video that's worth watching. So, yeah. So uh, see if you can dig it up and look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Norway has come under fire from environmentalists for continuing to support the oil and gas industry. Yes. Prime Minister Jonas Sture says that the world still needs its oil and gas during the transition to a cleaner energy future. Developing offshore wind will allow it to build on the know-how of its existing energy industry. Okay. Our next item is from, we have a picture of <clears throat> the coast of, of Alaska. That's a nice mountain. Isn't it? And um, this is from Clean Technica. Interior, that's the Department of Interior, Nixon's oil and gas leak sales in Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico. The this, is, this is good news, actually. Yeah, the Department of Interior is canceling three oil and gas lease sales off the coast of Alaska and in the Gulf of Mexico. The leases would have opened up over a million acres for development in ocean ecosystems vital to endangered species, fishermen, native people, and others. Well, the Department of Interior <coughs> should commit to no new leases. Yeah. Okay, we do not need more leasing. Industry is sitting on 11 million acres of ocean already leased for drilling and using less than a quarter of it. We don't okay, need they've given the leases out. Nobody's even using them. Yeah. Cook Inlet, <clears throat> that's what, we're, what they're talking about in Alaska, yeah. is in South Alaska near Anchorage. And we've yeah. talked about that on the show. Yeah. Further development would affect the endangered beluga whale. Yes. Okay, as well as native communities and fishermen who rely on a healthy ocean. Yep. Allowing leasing would increase the greenhouse gas emissions that fuel climate disasters in a state already deeply affected by the climate crisis. Okay. And it says Alaska is warming faster than any other state. Yeah. Okay, our next item is from Metro. What a funny looking airplane. We here. got a drone there. And um, there we go, a little bitty drone. Yes, it's a little little bitty drone. Drone seized at the UK nuclear bases after a swarm, and I'll explain what a swarm is, and a report <laughs> of red lights. Um, drones have been seized by security personnel at nuclear facilities with one report of a swarm at a UK installation. Newly released file, files show the unmanned aerial systems were cited at plants across the country and concerns over security threat threat they pose. What is a swarm? A swarm is an in a bunch, well, I'll say in a swarm, interconnected drones take part in the same operation. Okay. So they're not just a few drones, they're all doing the same thing. Ooh. So we have robust, and this is from, from England, the widespread, avail widespread availability of drones has had ramifications for the UK's critical infrastructure. Unmanned aircraft are not allowed to fly in the airspace of UK nuclear plants. Yeah, for good reason. For very good reasons. Yeah. We have robust security measures in place at all UK defense sites, including nuclear bases. People are using drones for nefarious purposes all around the world. Yeah, they are. Okay. In a swarm, well, I said that one. Incidents said to have involved a half dozen craft on each occasion have occurred at Palo, Al Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station in California. Right. So we've gone from England to California. Yep. China and Russia have each been linked to concerted physical and cyber spying operations. Yeah. They, they wouldn't do that. No, they would do that. We should get going, Tom. A nice picture of some transmission lines. There is a nice picture. And you know, when I see sunset, sunrise, I very often try to find that space between the yellow uh -huh. near the sun <laughs> and the blue in the sky where the 
where the sky well, is you, green. You succeeded this time. In this particular shot, it's, um, I think, enhanced. This is from Reuters. Creaky U.S. power grid threatens progress on renewables and EVs. The nation's transmission network, plagued by outages and increasingly severe weather, needs a trillion-dollar overhaul to handle the Biden administration's promised clean energy revolution and deal with climate change. Unfortunately, no one is taking charge of that operation. Well, now, EVs are electrical vehicles, yes. of course, and they are inevitable. Yes. The U.S. clean energy business is booming. Yes. With soaring electric car sales and fast growth in wind and solar. That's raising hopes for the fight against climate change. Right. The fight against climate change. This progress could be derailed without a massive overhaul of America's antiquated electric infrastructure. Now, Tom, I'm going to say something, and my bet is you're going to agree with me. We should not need to be building a trillion dollars worth of, of transmission lines. We should be building distributed power that I is used locally. I agree with you totally. The old model of a few large stations connected by massive yep. uh, power lines is, is over. I, I, there we and are. And you said the word, distributed power. Yeah. Power outages over the last six years have more than doubled in number. That's scary. The needed infrastructure investments are controlled by a web of local, state, and regional regulators who have strong political incentives to hold down spending. Right. Power sharing among regions with often conflicting interests makes it extremely challenging to coordinate any national security to modernize the grid. Yes. I think it's going to happen on its own. Yeah, I think it. I think it will, and it'll become less important as people go to. Well, they say upgrading the grid won't be cheap or easy. Yeah, the renewable power expansion would coincide with a massive demand surge from electric cars. Mm -hmm. That's coming, guys. Yeah, it is. U.S. But... The Energy Department estimates Americans will use forty percent more electricity by twenty fifty. Yeah, I and most of that's it. going to come from cars. I I believe it. Okay, our next item is from CNN. We have a nice and picture here. We have a picture of the Fayette Power Project. Is that what that is? That's what, That's it, what says. it says. Huh? That is a coal-burning power plant. And it's located near Austin, Texas. Yeah, and there's... And you can see the coal in the foreground. Ah, yes, you can. And you can see the ramps if you look on the right side of the, of the building. That's how you deter, you can detect That's how you know that there's... Yeah, they got there's, those ramps yeah. there. Okay, what do you got for a title? Well, if we look a little bit longer here, we'll figure that out. Okay. Texans asked to turn up thermostats after sweltering heat knocked six power plants offline. Now, huh? Yeah. Huh? Okay. The Didn't electric... they just go through something like this last winter? Yes, we did, except that it, Texas lost. In Texas. Yeah, in Texas, yeah. but it was cold last winter. It was cold. The so electric... it's cold and it's hot. Yes. They, they, cold you lose, hot you lose. That's right. The electric... Reliability Council of Texas, which is very often called ERCOT, made, right. made the appeal in a statement saying that soaring temperatures increased the demand and caused six power generating facilities to trip offline. The result in that loss was about was a loss of about uh, 2,900 megawatts, which is two point... Is, is there some kind of backstory between the, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas not wanting to cooperate with anybody else? Well, yeah. I mean, they, they, <laughs> there they are in the middle of Texas, and they're saying, we don't, want to, we don't want to cooperate with other people. We don't want to be dependent on them. Well, we got a couple of notes here. In yeah. February 2021, record cold temperatures caused the plant's highest electricity demand. And we talked about that on yeah, the show. Yeah. In May of 2022, which is now, an early season heat wave is searing much of Texas. Yep. Temperatures are to be 10 to 15 degrees above average. Which in Texas is it's deadly. Hot. Yeah. Now, the, th the thing about this is that um, I, have, I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out which six power plants they were. Um, what they, what kind of power They're plants? They're keeping it they secret, were. huh? They are not telling anybody. However, I did come across a title, and I couldn't read it because it was in a, it was behind a paywall. 
And I, ne I never do, I never do um, uh, subscriptions to places behind paywalls because if I do that, I know I'm going to be putting those links into my blog accidentally, and then people would have to subscribe in order yeah. to get to them. I don't want to force that on people. But the the um, the title said um, that the 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 grid did not go down, and the reason why the grid didn't go down is because of the amount of renewable energy that has been installed in the last year. They're keeping that a deep dark secret, aren't they? <laughs> okay. In February 2021, record cold temperatures caused the state's highest electricity demand. Yeah. Didn't I say this? In May 2022, an <laughs> early season this. heat wave is searing much of Texas. You did say that. I did. I thought I did. Okay. We're up to Monday, May 16th. Deja vu all over again. Deja vu all over again. Yeah. And we're up to nice Monday. a picture of a semi-truck. That is a Tesla, Tesla semi-truck, truck, which does not have a uh, uh, grid on the front, grill on the front. It's an electric truck. It's an electric truck. This is from Clean Tech. You're going to see more of them. It makes sense because yeah, it's well, easy to hide the batteries on it. Oh, yeah. If you look underneath the, the driver's side door, there's a great big place in there that, it was, that holds batteries. That's where they're putting them in trucks. Yeah. Okay. What do you well, got? Well, it's a time? Tesla Semi, and it's a, well, it's a Tesla Semi. The East Coast diesel crisis highlights the urgency for widespread EV adoption. News of, on of available, news on availability of diesel oil has some trucking companies worried, according to a report for if in freight waves. There are solutions that would help both the truckers and everybody else. One critical uh, solution is switching from diesels vehicles to EVs. And they would it would help the the diesel truck drivers to have to be running on electricity, but it would also help the people anybody who, who has to breathe air is helped yeah, if we don't absolutely. have diesel pollution. Well the East Coast normally has around sixty two million barrels of diesel stored in, stored in May. Yeah. This year it's under fifty two million. Okay. That's 84%, by the way. Okay. Since the start of 2022, the price of diesel has reached a record high. On the East Coast, it's reached $5.90. I haven't seen that, which is up 63% from January of 2022. If that's up only 63%, then it was high in January of 2022. It was. It was. Yeah. And it takes 18 days for oil to travel through the pipeline from Houston to New Jersey. Wow. Okay, our next item. Well, it says electric vans are 28% cheaper to own than their diesel versions. Yeah. Okay, our next item is from Clean Tech. Well, we got a picture here. Let's, we have let's a picture of picture. a Volvo car being charged. And I don't know what that thing is that that guy's carrying. I think it's a handle. Oh. I, okay. I, I, was, I puzzled myself around that too, but I think it's a handle. Okay. I can it's a, believe it's it. It's an on-off switch. Okay. It's got the uh, got a lightning bolt on it. Yeah. What have you got for a title? Aha. Uh -huh. I bet you if I look, I can find it. European ministers back CO2 emission standards for cars and vans. Environment Committee MEPs, that's members of European... Members of the European Parliament. Parliament. I had to look that up too. ...are in favor of a pathway towards zero emission and mobility in 2035 for new passenger cars and light commercial vehicles. The plan would mitigate negative economic impact of the transition with targeted funding. That's kind of important that people who are uh, going to be losing jobs or whatever because of a change away from fossil fuels and to... Um, electricity will have some kind of help to get out of that. Well, the EU has objectives, and there's two of them that this one outlines. Deliver benefits to citizens by deploying zero emission vehicles more broadly. Yeah. Leading to better air quality, energy savings, and a lower cost for owning a vehicle. Yep. And that's what's going to take it. That's yep. what's going to do it. And the other objective is to stimulate innovation in zero emission technologies. Yep. Okay, we have an item here from CNN. Let's move along. We got another picture. Oh yes, up. we do. Oh. And this is an whoa. What happened? <laughs> there we go. 
No, that's not the one. That's no, the one. That's the one. And I'll, I'll okay. pull that one off CNN. if I can. I got the wrong, got the wrong mouse. We always are very professional here <laughs> in case anybody's looking. We know exactly what we're doing. Never make a mistake. This is all planned. We actually practice in advance to make sure that we do these Well, that things. picture is a picture of vineyards in the Napa Valley. In the Napa Valley, that's right. That's and by the way, I saw an up tight, close picture of one of these vineyards. And the, uh, bu the, the, the grape bushes, whatever they call them, Vines. they're only about two feet tall. Uh, some of them. Some yeah. of them, yeah. And this, this whole vineyard, they were all these little tiny things. Tiny that was things. kneeling on the ground next to them. Huh. Well, California is in a water crisis, yet usage is way up. Officials are focused on the wrong problem. A group, of adv a group advocating for affordable access to clean water said that urban communities don't seem to understand the severity of the water crisis in a way that rural communities do, where water could literally stop flowing out of the tap. What they're saying is people who live in cities turn on the water, the water's there. They take it for granted. <clears throat> they take it for granted. Most of the people lives in the cities. The result of that is that huge numbers of people in California where there's horrible drought is happening are acting like it's not happening. Well, part of the problem is that the urgency of the crisis isn't breaking through to Californians. Some of them. The ones who work in the vineyards and the ones who grow lettuce in Central Valley and so forth, they know. Well, the Metropolitan Water District is announcing severe water restrictions. Right. And the article mentioned that uh, one of the biggest users of water is watering lawns. Well, there you go. Okay, now we come to an article from ESI Africa. Ah, we got that picture that we wanted to, we were looking at very briefly there. Yeah. That they say is a Morocco to UK subsea cable, but it can't be because they haven't made it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it might be an artist's rendering of the cable. No, it's another one. Yeah. It's okay. One. This is, as I said, it's from ESI Africa. What do you have for a title? African Renewable Energy to Power UK Homes with a New Subsea Cable. Okay. I want to stop here and consider that when the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant's contract with the state of Vermont came to an end, and they, they had been selling us uh, electricity at three and a half cents per kilowatt hour, I think it was three and a half, might have been three. They came to us and said that they would give us electricity at a price we couldn't refuse. I remember hearing which was, this. Which was six and a six, half cents. Six cents or something, yeah. And instead of taking that, we refused it and got- We got it for six cents. Six, got it for six cents <laughs> from Hydro-Quebec. <laughs> and um, that electricity uh, is, has been serving us ever since. Now. Octopus Energy Group and x will partner to build a subsea cable to deliver 3.6 gigawatts. Can you imagine a 3.6 gigawatt cable? That's crazy. That's, of renewable that's a, well, <laughs> it's huge. not one cable. Yeah, it's I know. four. <laughs> of renewable energy from Morocco to the UK. I don't have it in front of me, but how far is that, Tom? 2,500 miles. 25, so they're going to build a 2,500-mile cable. Going to build four of them. They're going to build four of them. <laughs> if we had a 2,500 mile cable starting in Brattleboro and going down the Connecticut River, we could run that to Cuba. By the way, they make these cables, or some of these cables are made right next door in uh, New Hampshire. Yes. Now, let me continue. Once complete, the project will be capable of supplying 8% of Britain's electricity needs for $59 per megawatt hour, which is five. Point nine cents. I said six, so we're, we're close. Well, by golly, that's lower than the six and a half cents that we were ordered, uh, offered by Vermont Yankee. And yeah, yet- And we, we were told we couldn't, we couldn't turn it down. Yeah, and yet the government of the UK is still pushing building big nuclear power plants that are gonna produce electricity at twice that price. Something's going on here that we don't know about. <laughs> we can guess that. We can guess. Yeah. So, well, I'll put it very succinctly. Somewhere, somehow, somebody is making money. Yes, I believe you're right. Should we go on? The partnership will generate up to 10 and a half gigawatts from wind and solar power in Morocco. Yes. 
and deliver 3.6 gigawatts in, into the UK for an average of 20 hours a day. Now, this is what this means is that there's a lot of electricity. The majority of the electricity produced. This thing produced, in, in, in Morocco is huge. It's huge. But a lot of that electricity is going to be used locally in Morocco or in other places. Oh, yeah. The uh, UK is not getting all of Morocco's generation. Right. This is a big, well, it, it's going to cover an area of about a thousand square miles. So this is a very big, uh, nu uh, not nuclear, uh, uh, solar. Renewable wind. energy. Renewable it's going energy. to be solar, solar and wind. Wind and battery. And the battery is gigantic. I bet it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bet. Our next item comes from Clean Tech. Ah, we got a picture there. It looks like coal, picture. but it's not. It well, it actually looks like coal because it's basically carbon, except it isn't coal. Well, they call it carbon. Bio, they call yeah, it biochar. biochar, which we would call charcoal. Yeah, and it's we've talked about biochar before. What do you have for a title? Well, I guess I can uh, look and find out what, what okay. it's going to be. Uh, that's, gotta, that's the yeah. right mouse for the machine. Carbon work. Future Partners. Carbon Future partners with bioenergy for 17,500 tons of carbon renewal. Yes. So and Carbon a, Future, that's what they do. They, carbon, they, re, they, they, make they remove carbon. Yeah. Uh, Switzerland's bioenergy is joining forces with Carbon Future, which is a carbon renewable, renewal platform for... 17,500 tons, that's metric tons, which would be 19, almost 20,000 regular tons, short tons, uh, for carbon removal delivery. The plant will take residual biomass from the, in the form of wood and convert it to biochar through pyrolysis. Well, pyrolysis call, is what they call heating organic material in the absence of hydrogen. Oxygen. I'm sorry, oxygen, <laughs> yes. And it's usually conducted at high temperatures, above 500 C. Yes, and what that does is it breaks up the cellulose, for example, into, into char, uh, um, I don't want to, I shouldn't call it char, into carbon, and, and also gases, and those gases are typically burned to, to run the process. So it doesn't have yeah, extra. Yeah, yeah. So it's using it, the gases that are being generated. That's right. That's pretty clever, actually. Isn't it? And <laughs> Well, that's, I put the picture back up. That yeah, is the char. That's the char. And um, the biochar, if it's properly made, what I have read is that you can actually take a, a piece of biochar and you can actually see the grain of the wood still in it. That's interesting. And when this gets buried in the ground... It will absorb water like a sponge. Uh huh. But it does other things too. Those those channels that used to conduct water through the wood now are places where uh, various micro flora can can live and thrive. Mm -hmm. and they can be very good for the soil. This is a really good soil so this amendment. This is a plus plus kind of thing. Yeah. Well, Switzerland's Bioenergy, that's the name of the company, yeah. is joining forces with Carbon Future, which is the other company, and they're a carbon renewal company, yeah. for 17,500 tons. We've just said that of carbon renewal, removal delivery over a three-year period. Okay. This volume is the rough equivalent of the yearly emissions of 1,250 people. Okay. Our next item is something that I find kind of cool. It's... This picture is... Um, Let's get that picture up there. The picture is going to have to be explained. This is from Clean Technica. That picture is a, is a rendering of a, of a... They're uh, making a tube. They're making a tube, but it's a gigantic tube. And the tube is being made by spiral welding huge plates of steel. Instead of taking the thing and making the long yeah. linear weld, they're making a continuous That's spiral. That's right. And that tube is going to be the mast of a very, very tall wind turbine. Well, they explain that in the article. Yes, they do. The uh, south spiral welding can bring taller wind turbines to the U.S. southeast. Yes. The southeast, well, you're going to say this. Yes, the southeast low wind speeds are holding back wind energy in that region. The problem can be resolved by taller wind turbines to harvest more optimal wind speeds higher off the ground. Taller turbines can be made 
at the site by spe special welding technology. The problem Sounds is- Sounds like a win-win situation. It does. The problem is that when you have the really long blades and the really long masts of these yeah. really big turbines, they're kind of difficult to get down a road. Well, we've shown pictures of that on the show yeah. here. They're, they are very difficult. They're very difficult. And one of the solutions to that is build these things right near the water. Right near where they're going to be used. Well, near the, but they're going to float them there. Oh, well, no, these things using this technology, they don't have to float it. They can, no, they can make it right on the site. They can make it right on the site. That's, That's what right. the article says. But well, the, the fact that you make it right on the water means that you can get these things out to offshore wind and you can have the much bigger turbines, much bigger towers than you can have. Yeah, you. well, the article didn't say they could bring these things out in the water, but there isn't any reason I can think of that they can't, yeah. they won't. Yeah. Well, new technology for constructing taller wind turbines will open up the wind power floodgates in the U.S. Southeast. Right. Currently, infrastructure issues include bridges, tunnels, and winding roads. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Denver-based firm Keystone Tower Systems has been working on raising the height of steel turbine towers, and they've developed a spiral welding technology right. where they just continuously weld and they can make these things twice as long as they ever could before. Right. They probably well, can make them longer than that, but there's I would other think. Restraints. We'll just see. We'll see in one day where. Well, this the all technique requires up. only one machine to construct the tower section, and it can produce towers up to twice as tall, ten times faster. Wow. Okay. The equipment can be shipped and used on site. Well, yes. on site could be, could mean out into the ocean. That's right. Eliminating the transportation issues. Okay. The single machine will use steel shipped flat to the site to complete the joining, rolling, fit up welding, and severing for continuous production of tapered steel tower shells. Right. So they okay. can make those things probably longer than the article says. We are up to Wednesday, May 18th. I think we are. We have three items to talk about in well, seven minutes. And our we first can talk one, about three items in seven minutes. Uh, We've got to get a picture of it. First one is from CNN. That is That's a wheat the Indian harvest. wheat crop. And you can pretty much tell by looking at that that it was not harvested by John Deere. I think you're right. I think it was harvested <laughs> by what? Indians? Indians. Probably with sickles. <laughs> well, India offered to help fix the global food crisis. Here's why it backtracked. A month ago, Russia's war with Ukraine pushed the world to the brink of a food, food crisis, and India's Prime Minister Narendra, uh, Narendra Modi offered to help countries facing shortages. Now, life-threatening heat worsened by climate change is set to stunt output well, putting, India is putting the, an end to that goal. India is the world's second biggest producer of wheat after China. Okay. Okay. In the 12 months up to March, India exported a record 7 million tons, up more than 250%. Wow. Now, wheat exports are banned. Yeah. As life-threatening heat waves in South Asia stunt the output and push local prices to record this highs. Is what, this is being done by climate change. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica, and we have a picture of soybean fields. Now, that is a big soybean field. Well, you know, you drive along the interstate that goes east-west across the top of the United States. Yes. And you see a lot of fields like this. Um, I a believe A lot it. of fields. Like I believe this. it. But you don't expect to see them in the middle of what used to be Amazon rainforest. I don't think so. There's a one-minute video in this one, but it's not that great of a video. So. Oh, okay. What? Brazilian community leaders call on the EU to stop promoting ecocide. Right. And ecocide is killing the ecology. Yes, that's right. Industrial soybean farmer is causing destruction and conflict in Brazil, in, in part driven by the European Union's biofuel policies. Community leaders from Brazil have asked the EU to stop this ecocide in a joint press release from Transport and Environment and from Rainforest Foundation Norway. Well, today, many biofuels have higher, higher CO2 emissions than the fuels they replace. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what is this? 
Palm oil and soy oil are linked to large-scale deforestation. Yeah. And it's happening in the, uh, what's the forest in Brazil? Amazon? Amazon, yeah. (laughs) Yes, I remembered that name. It's It's happening big time in Brazil. Yeah. Well, the production and export of biofuels and biocommunities in Brazil has been carried out at the expense of increased food insecurity and environmental impact through deforestation. Right. So there's second order consequences that are pretty damaging. The extensive use of pesticides is contributing. Areas cultivated with soy have increased by 220% in the last 30 years while the areas of beans and rice have decreased by about 50%. Yeah. So something's happening, folks. Okay, our last story. We've got a picture here. It's from Clean Tech. The car is coming right up. Yep, and it it is a picture of a Volvo, and I can't tell if that has a grill or not. Well, it it, it doesn't have a grill, because it's a a plug-in electric. Yes, okay. Well, let's just, yeah. What's the title? Ford and Volvo Cars and a Broad Industry Coalition appeals to the EU for all new cars and vans to be zero emission from 2035. A broad cross-industry coalition including Ford of Europe and Volvo Cars. By the way, Volvo Cars is not the same company as Volvo Trucks. No, it's not. They were separated. Separated, right. Volvo Cars is owned by people in... I don't what know. Is it, Denmark? I don't know. But Volvo Trucks is owned by a Chinese company. It's owned by the Chinese, yes. huh? How about that? Um, a broad cross industry coalition is uh, appealing to the European Union to ensure that all new cars and vans in Europe are zero emissions from 2035 and to establish charging infrastructure targets. Well, a deadline for new fossil fuel engines is necessary to yeah. ensure the last internal combustion cars are off the road by 2050. Yeah, absolutely. So there you have it. And um, what we're going to do, Tom and I, we're going to suggest that you all have an an ineffably and uh, enthralling week. Well, we is, don't have any more is- items to talk about. Nope. I mean, we could. Why don't you put that up? I think I'll put that up yep. if I can figure out how. <laughs> there <laughs> You've we done go. It before. That you all have an ineffably enthralling week. Ineffably. Ineffably. Ineffably enthralling. Enthralling. I'm going to have to figure out how to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, why don't you put us both up and we'll wave goodbye. Well, that can be done. I'm sure it can. We can can do that by doing this. There you go. And this. It's a two step process. And uh, we wave goodbye. Come back back and see us now, you hear? Yeah. 